guys, I'm Sriman. In this video, I'll be covering the top 10 misconceptions, questions, concepts, the style of questioning that Cambridge loves to ask. In what topic? The topic of measurement in H2 physics. So I'll be sharing really important cheat codes and tips which will help you do well for your A-level physics. So stay tuned and watch this till the end. Let's jump right in. Number one, guys, is... Compare these two statements right now and tell me which one is right and which one is wrong. Alright guys, I have two statements right here and a Cambridge question asked me which one is the correct statement. One of them is correct, one of them is wrong. Think about it and tell me the answer. The correct statement is number one, not this one. Right, why? It's not about knowing which statement is correct because this is found in your notes, but why is this wrong? Now, we have to analyze one important thing, which is speed. This comes down to the concept of base quantities and derived quantities. You know base quantities, right? Like time, mass, length, temperature, amount, luminous intensity, and those kind of things. Speed here is equals, V is equals the distance over time. So this right here, speed, is a derived quantity. Am I right? It's a derived quantity, so a derived quantity is expressed as a product or a quotient of its base units. The base units are the seven units that you need to know. That includes mass, length, time, and temperature. So, this statement is correct because this is a base quantity. This right here, unit time, is a base quantity. This is wrong because while this is a base quantity, this one is not a base quantity. This is the SI unit of time. And time is the base quantity. So it does not fulfill, this statement does not fulfill this definition of a derived quantity. So this is wrong. And this is what you must say when Cambridge asks you this kind of question. Alright guys, number two. This strategy is really foolproof and it's very effective when you forget important formulas that you have to remember when answering a question, all right? So, I'll give you an example, okay? You see that maybe you see this unit, joule per kilogram per kelvin, and you're like, oh, uh, I don't seem to recall a formula. You start to panic during the exams. Just calm down, all right? Look at the units one by one link it to their base units. So J right here is the SI unit of energy. Kilogram is the SI unit of mass. Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature. Am I right? So the formula has some variable x which is equal to energy divided by mass times temperature, correct? So because it's in a denominator, it produces the negative one power. And this has really, really helped me when I forget the formulas, but I just look at the units and I realize, oh, I, I somehow have to, you know, take this value divided by this times this value and I'll get the answer. And it has work. In this case, this red X right here is the specific heat capacity of a certain substance. Next, under the same concept, MCQs love to ask this kind of question. They give you certain equations like C is equal to Q over V. Number one, this equation is the equation for capacitance and it's not in the syllabus. But that doesn't mean you should panic because you know what Q is and you know what V is. And then the question asks you, express C in terms of their base units. And ask to find the base units of C. How do you do that? Calm down, okay? Let's take it step by step. Number one, what do you do? Go back to your fundamental definitions of each of these variables. What is Q? Charge. Where have you heard of the word charge? You heard it in the topic of current electricity, chapter 14. So Q, remember, learned about current is charge over time, the rate of flow of charge. So if you just bring this equation over, it just be I, T, correct? Where do you hear of V, voltage? Voltage is the work done per unit charge to move it around a circuit or move it 
across two points. Am I right? So voltage is work done. So work done can put it as E or can put it as W divided by the charge. Right? This is just the fundamental definitions and I'm expressing it in terms of formulas. Next, right here, every step of the way you are going to ask, is this still the base unit? Is current the base unit? Yes. Time? Yes. Charge? No. Work done is also not. So what do you do? Q right here is again equal to IT. Am I right? This thing is equal to IT. So if we bring it over, it will become I squared T squared over W. Am I right? But right, let's continue from here. Work done. Where do you study it? The topic of forces. You study work done is the force times multiplied by the displacement in the direction of the force. So it's I squared T squared over force times distance, which we'll call D. Now, is it still base unit? No, force is still not a base unit. What is force? The concept of dynamics. So many chapters, right? Dynamics. It's I squared T squared over F equals to MA, right? So it's MAD. Yes, we are really mad about this question. It's so annoying, man. So, MA, acceleration, still not done. What's acceleration? Acceleration is velocity over time. So it's I squared T squared over M, what? M, V over T, D. And we'll just bring it over because it's making it really complicated. Now, is velocity a base unit? No, it is not. Let's continue from here. Velocity is distance over time, correct? Velocity is distance over time. Let's rearrange everything and get our form, final one, I square, we bring this over, T4 divided by M D squared, correct? Am I right? And finally, all these are base units, correct? So, what is the final one? I, SI unit, is amperes squared, T is seconds, so that would be second, fourth, Right, the order doesn't matter. M stands for mass, so it's kilogram inverse. D is distance, so that would be meters minus two. All right, that's it, guys. That's how you find the units of capacitance in base units. Now this question comes up a lot in MCQ. Just remember, go back to fundamental definitions. Ask at every step, is it the base units? And finally, know that they can span across different topics. Alright, so far what am I doing in this video? I'm posing questions and helping you recall and retrieve the knowledge. This is something called active recall. Recall your content and apply. This is the best way to study. Let's bring on the concept number three. Just a bit more technical and detail. You guys know the scale, right? Milli, micro, nano, pico. And you guys know kilo, mega, giga, tera. But there are two things that people ignore. The concept of deci and the concept of centi. I say I don't know why people struggle with this. Centi is just centimeter, guys. One meter is 100 cm. So what is 1 cm? What is centi? Centimeters is just 1 over 100. Ex we are expressing each of these things as a fraction of the 1 meter. So centi is 1 over 100, which is 10 to the power of minus 2 meters. What's deci? Not many people have heard of it, but it's right in between a meter and a centimeter. It's 10 to the power of minus 1 meters. Please note this because a lot of people forget and then they, they screw up during the exams, okay? Guys, concept number 4 is very important. Cambridge loves to test this question. Distinguish between random and systematic errors. Now what do you do? They give you two, three marks. They are wondering what should you put in your answer. Number one, if you guys don't want to do, simple, just write out the definitions. Write out the definitions. What is a systematic error? Systematic error results in all readings lying below or above the accepted true value. Random error results in a scattering of readings about the true value or the accepted value. So you can just write out the definitions and hopefully they'll give you one mark. But this is not what the video is for. I'll help you distinguish them. In systematic errors, all readings lie above or below 
all are above or below the true value. In random errors, it is a combination of both. So some are above, some are below. And some might be exactly the true value, in fact. And that is the first difference, okay? This is like an either or, but this one is, is a combination of both. Number two, guys, random errors result in the readings being about the true value, correct? You guys know that. But it is by an unfixed amount. Whereas for systematic, it is a fixed amount. See, for systematic error, you have zero and your zero error in a micrometer screw gauge. That is a systematic error because, for example, the zero error is plus one cm. So that means that all your readings will be one cm larger. So that is a fixed amount of one cm. A random errors can be anything. Could be 0.1, could be 0.2, can be some. Like human reaction time is a random error, can range, it's a range from 0.2 to 0.4 seconds. So it's not a fixed amount. And the third point is accuracy and precision. Random errors affect. And number three, guys, random errors affect precision, while systematic errors affect accuracy. Now, what is accuracy? What is precision? Precision is a degree of agreement between different readings of the same physical quantity. That means the readings don't have to lie at say that actual value is like 5 centimeters. And your readings are like here. So uh, your readings are like this is 4 centimeters, this is like 3.95, this is like 4.05, this is like 3.97. But all the readings are like localized somewhere here. In this case, the readings here are precise, but they are affected by random errors. So the greater the random error, the readings are going to be like much more like spread out. Okay? The systematic errors affect the accuracy. Your actual reading could be like 1 cm, okay? But your readings are like literally like 0 cm and are like super far away. So that means there some, must be some systematic error. Alright guys, these are the three differences, and if you guys panic, just write out the definitions and just move on. Right, let me change my marker color so that it looks much better for you guys. Concept number five. This is very important because they ask this question in theory as well as practical. Why does graph drawing help you? You are in your practicals. You probably have to draw velocity, time graphs, they give you this huge graph grid and they ask you to draw best fit lines and do calculations and it's so freaking annoying, right? But why did you ever ask this question? Why does graph drawing even help besides just finding out the relationship? It has four things that I want you guys to take note. Number one, you are able to spot systematic errors. And how do you guys spot systematic errors? For example, okay, you release a ball from the top of a ramp and then it slides to this marker right here and you ask to measure the time it takes for the ball to move from this point to this point, for example. And then you calculate the velocity, calculate all this stuff and you draw a velocity time graph and you find out, oh damn, the graph doesn't pass through the origin. It is like, it is like, for example, like that. That means there was some systematic error. Maybe they did not release it from the correct position. And then they ask you during your practicals to spot the error, what could have gone wrong in the experiment. But don't be afraid. Okay, in practicals, it's totally safe. It's not a problem. Now, number two, this is getting kind of intuitive. The concept of a best fit line. A best fit line reduces random errors. Why does it reduce random errors? So you have like your readings that are like that, 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 and then say you draw a best fit line, say for example, like that. You draw a best fit line like that. Now, your random errors results in the scattering of readings about a true value, correct? It could be above or below. So it's like you drawing the best fit line that cuts through the middle and it minimizes the distances from, of the points from the best fit line. Actually, you guys will be learning it under the last topic of H2Math, which is correlation and regression. We'll learn about how best fit line reduces random errors. But here I'm just giving you a small preview and how it's tested for physics. Alright guys, I forgot to mention this. 
how does taking more readings and taking the average reduce random errors? Cambridge loves to test this question. And if you guys are wondering how to answer, I have to answer just right in front of you on your screen. So do you take a look and comment down in case you did not understand it, right? Now back to this one. The third thing why growth showing helps, it helps you to find the anomalous points. So for example, your best fit line is very sweet, but you have this weird value right here, okay? That doesn't even fit with the best fit line. This could be due to some error when you're measuring some problem happened because we humans make mistakes, right? Then what I ask to do in practicals is circle this and call this anomalous and don't include it in your calculations, all right? So it helps you identify anomalous points. Now the last thing that it helps you, which is a really hard point that not many people get, is the concept of limit of proportionality. No, it's not integration, nothing related to differentiation or all that. What's the limit of proportionality? I would like guys to recall where you have heard this. Have you heard of this in forces under Hooke's law? The F and the X graph. You extend this, okay? If you extend the spring, correct? The force that is stored in the spring increases. This is a Y equals to MX graph. Okay, this is your spring constant. Now, what is the limit of proportionality? Hooke's law states that unless the limit proportionality is exceeded, it forms a straight line. But in the event you did a practical, you drew this similar graph, and you find that your graph suddenly like your points are like a bit curved and kind of sways off. I'd like guys to think what is the problem, okay? If you guys don't inform the examiner of what happened, you're sabotaging your friend who's going to take your practical next. Right, I'll just show you why. Because you damaged the spring. You stretched it so much during the experiment and you screwed up the limit of proportionality. You have exceeded it. So it does not form a straight line relationship. So these are the four things which graph drawing helps you with. Okay? Concept number six. We have heard of this in measurement. Is this upper, lower, bound, theorem or some kind of formula where you just calculate the uncertainty when you use one value and uncertainty in another value and you take the modulus of x max minus x min and you divide it by 2 to find the uncertainty. Remember this formula measurement? Now some people are asking is this formula relevant? The answer is yes and no. The reason is because this thing helps you when you are dealing with trigonometry ratios that involve cos, sine, tangent, and where we can come across this kind of trigonometric ratios, you may come across this in the topic of superposition. Yeah, do check out my previous video on how to deal with this difficult topic of superposition. The link is up there as well as in the description. So they can ask you like sine theta is lambda over b. They give you some values and ask you to find the uncertainty in sine theta and then you have to use this one, correct? For example, theta is 26 degrees and theta is 24 degrees and then you put sine 26 minus sine 24 over 2 and then you get the uncertainty of lambda over b, for example, okay? But generally, Cambridge hasn't really tested this concept for quite a long time. They usually test you the four formulas that I will state in concept number 7. So, I think it's just worth studying but it's not that important. Now I have concept number seven, which is like the three or four important formulas that you need to remember when finding the uncertainty. And they ask you this a lot of times in Cambridge questions. Number one, they say they ask you some Q is equals to 2x minus 3y. And they ask you Qx plus 3y. This is Q2. What is the uncertainty of Q in both cases? Is it the same or different? It is the same. So regardless if this is a plus or it's a minus, this one will always be a plus, correct? So if this A is negative or positive, you always take the modulus. So in this case, you take 2 instead of negative 2. So this will become 2 del x plus 3 del y. It's always a plus sign. Never put a minus sign because many people do that and get it wrong. Now this one. How do you find 
not the uncertainty, okay? The percentage or the fractional uncertainty. This is the absolute uncertainty. For this one, you're finding the percentage uncertainty. Percentage uncertainty is expressed as del Q divided by Q because it's a, it's a division of the original number. Now, how do you calculate this? This one, you ignore these coefficients. This thing doesn't make sense. There's no effect on the percentage uncertainty. So what would this become? You only care about the powers. So you bring down the powers like you do for logarithms, the power law in math. So you say m del x over x plus n. So you bring down the power, ignore the b, put del y over y. Note this, this is m, this is n, correct? Same thing for this one. This thing and this thing are the exact, have the same uncertainty, right? Regardless of it, n being negative or positive, you just put this negative or positive number right here. Just substitute it, okay? That's all they will ask you. And most importantly, people forget this point. Absolute uncertainty. Is it to 1SF or 2SF? It is 1SF, one significant figure. Percentage uncertainty, is it 1SF or 2SF? It is 2SF. For example, Q is some distance unit. Okay, so let's use D, the case of distance. So in distance, the actual distance that you measured was 1 meter. And then the uncertainty that you calculated was like 0 0.0357 meters. And this is like your uncertainty. This is your D, this is your del D, which is the uncertainty. Now, how do you express this in this equation? You will express this as D plus minus del D meters. Here you're finding the absolute uncertainty, not the percentage uncertainty. This is percentage uncertainty. This is absolute. So how do you express it? Okay, we'll put that one. Not yet. Okay, plus minus. So in this case, you'll put plus minus del t. This is absolute uncertainty, right? 1SF. What's the 1SF value? 0 0.04. So you put 0 0.04. So it follows 1SF. Then what does your trailing this thing do? It follows the decimal place, alright? So it follows the decimal place. This is 2dp. So it will be 1.00 plus minus 0 0.04 meters. This is how you guys express it. This thing follows the decimal point of this value, all right? This thing follows 1SF or 2SF depending on whether it's absolute or the fractional or percentage uncertainty. The difference between fractional and percentage uncertainty is just the same thing, just times 100%, okay? All right, in strategy number eight or concept number eight, we are gonna cover some important questions that people have. Number one, does unit change affect uncertainty? So for example, in the question they say x is equal to 1.0 plus minus 0 0.1 meters. And in the question you have to use it in centimeters for some goddamn reason. Then how do you convert it to CM? You are like kind of uncertain how to do that. Just calm down, okay? What is one meter? One meter is 100 centimeters, correct? So, the uncertainty of del m, okay, which we'll call it, we'll call it meters, okay, is, it's just the formula that I told you right now. Use the coefficient, okay, because this is absolute uncertainty. This is not percentage uncertainty. So, it's del m, is just carry over the coefficient, 100, del cm. So it's just 100 times of the other thing. So if you want to convert it to centimeter, you just times 100. So you times 100, you get what? 1 times 100, that would be 100. Plus minus, you times 100, you get 10. Correct? Do you put 0 0.0? No, no, no. Don't put 0, 0.0 because that is very accurate. You're looking at 0 0.1 cm. This is 0 0.1 meters. You've not measured to the 0 0.1 centimeter accuracy, guys. So don't put a decimal place. Just times 100 and just put the value there as centimeters. Right, many of you have this question, so hopefully you found this helpful. 
then how do you answer questions on uncertainty? A lot of people may have this question. For example, guys, let's recall the resistance formula for a wire. You guys have studied this in all levels, not just you have to study this in A levels. It's phi, which is resistivity, L over A, length over area. Now, for example, in the question, they give you the uncertainty of this, the uncertainty of this, the uncertainty of this. And then they ask you to find the uncertainty of the resistivity. Now, one thing you do is don't immediately use your del R over R is equals to da 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 da. Express this as the head of the equation. So you phi, you bring this A over R A, and you put the L down. Right? And then use the formula del phi over phi is del R over R plus del A over A plus del L over L. Now, what if, guys, they give you, say, distance is equals to 1.0 plus minus 0 0.1 meters. Now, how do you calculate the uncertainty of the area of a square, for example, which is d squared? How do you do it? You just take del A over A is equal to 2 del D over D. Okay, substitute the area value, substitute this, and you get an area. Right? So there's nothing to be scared of. So this will be the last two concepts to revise. Concept 9 and concept 10, I'll cover them together and I'm going to deal with the idea of vectors. Now many people don't know what vectors are. You just memorize that they have a magnitude as well as a direction. Correct? People know the idea of magnitude but they ignore this word called direction. Now, what examples of vectors? Displacement S, velocity V, acceleration, force, momentum, which is P. Correct? Energy? Is it a vector? No, it's a stored quantity. It is a quantity that's associated with a motion in the case of kinetic energy. In kinetic energy, which is half mv square, this V here is not the velocity. It is the speed, guys. Is the speed you take the magnitude that's why this thing right here is a scalar energy is a scalar quantity now people ignore direction which is very important for kinematics question for dynamics question for questions on forces questions of work energy power all these mechanical physics topics direction is important what are the two directions that they love to test you so one way to resolve is in the x and y directions for example you decided to be really playful and throw a ball at a certain angle, theta, to the horizontal. Okay? So if you look at this, this thing contains the vertical component Fy as well as the horizontal component Fx. And the magnitude of the Fx and Fy will affect the resultant force. This is like drawing a parallelogram, drawing, drawing your vector diagram, this weird parallelogram, remember? He's just using the same thing. In this case, we're using fx, fy, and it gives you a resultant, which would be like that. So the vertical component, you guys are smart, you know this trigonometry. Sine theta, correct, is what? Adjacent, no? Opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is the fy, the fy component, over the hypotenuse, which is the resultant force. So in this case, fy is equals to fr sine theta. And likewise, if you use adjacent of over hypotenuse, you'll get fr cosine of theta, this one. So this is how you resolve in the xy direction. Next, they will give you a slope. For example, you have this damn slope, okay, which is at an angle theta, and you have a box that's placed on the slope, assuming it's just stationary there due to friction. Now, the mass, the weight of this box, goes downwards. It's a force. It has direction. It goes downwards. So the second way you can resolve forces is parallel to, okay, so parallel to as well as perpendicular to the direction of the slope. So if you resolve the weight of the box in the perpendicular and parallel direction, parallel direction and the perpendicular direction, let's draw the normal force as well. This is the normal contact force. If you use some math relationship in figure it out, this angle is actually the theta. For those of you guys who are wondering why is this theta, you can use this triangle, you can use ratios and then find that this is theta as well. And if you guys still don't understand it, I'll be explaining this in more topical 
reviews of circular motion, gravitation, this will come again, no worries, okay? So this component, we resolve it. This is mg, so this one, and this one. This is theta. So this is like what we addressed in the previous one. So parallel to the slope and perpendicular to the slope, the perpendicular component is equals to mg cosine theta. The parallel component, fb, is equals to mg sine. So when you're trying to calculate f equals to ma and trying to use this equation, use this one. Because this one does nothing. It's perpendicular to the slope. This is the one. So use the parallel component during your calculations for dynamics question, which I'll explain in dynamics. Very important, very important. Please define a positive direction. I will literally take a red pen and actually highlight it. I will be highlighting this concept in my kinematics, dynamics, forces, and more topical reviews. Define the positive direction. For example, is it upwards positive, downwards positive? Is it to the left being positive? Is it right being positive? You need to define it first before you move on to the calculations. Because it doesn't make sense to have a negative answer if you don't use define the positive direction. So yes, that would be the end of the video guys. Hopefully it helped you cover a lot of misconceptions for measurement as well as some other topics. I'll be doing more reviews of more physics topics. So if you love this video, do subscribe, turn on the notification bell, share this with your friends, comment all your doubts below, and I'll see you in the next video where I'll cover kinematics, forces, and more topics. Thank you.